get started, I would love to introduce our incredible moderator for today. Um, his bio, his, by the way, he wrote his bio, and I cannot believe this because he's way more famous than just his, what his bio has written. <laughs> but uh, he's also very humble. Uh, Rodney Foxworth is the co-founder and CEO of Worthmore strategic consulting and venture development firm spe specializing in transformative business models, non-traditional capital solutions, and inclusive economic development, with a goal of creating wealth, optionality, and ownership for diverse communities and stakeholders. Prior to Worthmore, Rodney served as the CEO of Commune Future. Previously, he was the founder and CEO of Invested Impact, a consultancy and intermediary they facilitated millions of dollars in philanthropic and impact investment capital into, economic, into community economic development projects and social entrepreneurs of color. Rodney is an inaugural Ford Global Fellow and a Scholar Awardee of Social Innovation. Also, um, a fantastic moderator, so in with, we're in up for a treat. So thank you. Please join me welcoming Rodney. Thank you, Michelle. Um, you know, you did sort of, uh, when you said I was a fantastic moderator, you did have a little pause there. I just want to point that out. So I want to set the expectations for, for the rest of you. Um, no, but seriously, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to moderate this conversation. Um, I respect that there's a lot of humility in this, in this audience because I suspect that there are more folks in this room that have expertise on this topic and related topics than you actually are uh, demonstrating with your hands today. Um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation because we do have like some really amazing experts who have done an array of really, when we talk about alternative forms of corporate ownership and governance, they've done sort of like the full gamut. And so you've got in this like concentrated amount of time, you're going to listen to quite a few folks that have um, something to share with you, some real clarified case studies and examples and really the brass tacks of doing this this type of work, you're going to actually have an opportunity to really get into a little bit of the weeds with these folks as well. So I'm really thankful for this opportunity. Um, so the title of this, uh, this conversation is From Benefit Corporations to Perpetual Purpose Trusts, Alternative Forms of Corporate Ownership and Governance. And so let me introduce really quickly our panelists. We have, right to my right, Sarah Schwimmer of B-Lab Global. Uh, we have Greg Curtis of Hold Fast Collective, and then we also have Natalie Reitman White of Purpose Owned. Now, I'm going to actually start with um, Sarah here because it's implicit. Um, it might, we might be implicitly stating that everyone understands what a B Corp actually is, right, and what B benefit corporations are. So we want to set the context first because if we're saying we're going from benefit corporations to perpetual purpose trusts, we want to make sure that there's clarity for everyone in the audience who's entering this conversation to really understand what we're talking about from the core basis of benefit corporations and, and B Corp. So, Sarah, can you provide a little bit of context for us? Okay, it's on. It's already on. All right, great. <laughs> um, thank you. Yeah, ha happy to be here. Thanks all for joining us. Um, so my name is Sarah, I'm with B-Lab Global. Um, I think a number of folks in the room probably know B Corps or buy, pro have bought products with the B and the circle around it. Um, maybe you know what that means, maybe you don't. So the crash course on what that means is essentially if a company is a B Corp, they have gone through our rigorous comprehensive um, certification process and passed. Um, what that means um, and what is unique and really inspires me about B Corps is that uh, it is a pretty holistic way of looking at a company. So there are standards around um, workers. There are standards around climate impact. There are st standards around um, centering shareholder uh, primacy instead of just stakeholder governance. The standards are quite cross-cutting and that's quite unique um, and I think can therefore provide a bit more of a comprehensive look at a, at a company's um, contributions to our society, or even perhaps the um, better understanding what potential negative externalities they are taking um, or uh, resolving. Um, something that's really important about B Corps, though, is that um, it's now we're about 8,000 B Corps around the world, uh, and that represents somewhere around 700,000 workers around the world. We, over the past couple of years, have seen pretty unprecedented demand from uh, corporations, from companies looking 
to apply to go through our certification process to the point that frankly we've not even been able to keep up. And so if there are if there are any pending B Corps in the room and you've been waiting a while, I'm sorry and you, now you know why we're, we're working on that. It's a good problem to have, uh, but I raise that because um, it's we've been around 17 years or so now. We are now in the process of um, evolving what those standards look like for certification. And so that we'll be launching those in the next, uh, what is it, two years, it's 2023 still. Um, in my mind, we're in 2024 already, but we'll launch those in the next two years. And what is exciting about that, that and the reason I share that is that this is an evolution of our understanding of how do you actually incentivize impact from companies. The new standards will, instead of at the current level um, where you have to hit a certain score, um, and if you are surpassing that score, um, this is you know simplifying it, but then you can become a B Corp. In the new standards, we will have nine different um, uh, silos within that. So workers is one of them, climate is another one of them. You need to hit a minimum score in each of those. So what is interesting about that is that this is an evolution in understanding that you know, if a company is just doing everything right on workers, but actually has a really poor record on climate, theoretically, they could still become a B Corp right now. This is an, an evolution of understanding that, no, actually, if we are going to have this comprehensive look at how do companies do good, uh, we need to actually take a more um, segmented um, approach. And so I just share that because I think that's one evolution for us at B Lab on the, our certification process. The B Corp certification is one mechanism by which a company and, frankly, a consumer can understand um, how they want to, you know, spend their money. I think I, w I won't do your job, Rodney, but I think the perpetual purpose trust is yet another um, model. And so I'll just kick it back to you without without bringing it, bringing them in. Thank you for that, Sarah. So, <clears throat> Greg, we're going to go to Greg. Um, so Greg Curtis, as I said, um, is the uh, executive director of Holdfast Collective. And Holdfast Collective, if you do not know, is the entity that actually is responsible for the perpetual purpose trust of Patagonia. Now, one of the great things about this segue is that as this whole conversation is framed is around benefit corporations to perpetual purpose trusts. And so what better example uh, than Patagonia, which I know everyone knows of Patagonia. So, Greg, be, thanks for the, you know, uh, the, because of the wonderful uh, context that Sarah provided, can you share a bit about what it was about the B Corp movement and approach that one um, made Patagonia say, we want to do this? And then from, that, from there, can you provide the context for why Patagonia decided to actually move be, to perpetual purpose trust? Maybe there were some challenges or some opportunities that you saw, so you could share that with the audience. Absolutely, um, and I would say having been through several recertification process, project, uh, uh, you know, work and process at Patagonia, the, the impact assessment tool that B Lab has is, it's not just used by companies that are B Corps, it's used by companies that are thinking about being B Corps or just trying to get a better sense of how they score. So it's a, it's a wonderful sort of comprehensive view of all of these different segments of your business. And so it, it forces you to look in places that you might not sort of maybe you want, don't want to look at or sort of were avoiding because you didn't like the answers. And it's, it's just a really important way to see how you're ranking up against some of your other, um, other colleagues in the community. And, and I think community was, Rodney, the reason that um, we wanted to support and got behind the benefit corporation movement and then the, the certification. I mean, what was interesting about it is um, benefit corporation status was a little bit like perpetual purpose trust in terms of an ownership and um, an ownership model. But when Patagonia became a benefit corporation in California, there wasn't any, other than the articulated purposes that were important to us, which involved on-site childcare, transparency, supply chain improvement, product quality, footprint uh, impact in our, in our supply chain footprint. Um, there weren't, like, that was just what was important to us. Like, it, we weren't getting this comprehensive view that we would get from the impact assessment tool. And no state was really requiring you to, sort of forcing you to look at it in that independent, verified, comprehensive way. And so we, kind of, we knew that becoming a benefit corporate in California really wasn't enough. And we needed a, a movement building community that had standards. We knew the standards would evolve over time. And so, and we wanted to be scored. We wanted to understand how we stacked up to just be honest with ourselves. Um, 
And so when the opportunity came and B-Lab was building momentum, it just made all the sense in the world to support this community. And um, I shared this this morning, but one of our purposes, transparency, we talked to a lot of folks. Um, you know, inevitably, they're sharing with us things that they're doing really well. So we learn a lot when we engage with that community, too. There's a lot of younger companies. We're old. We're sort of set in our ways in some ways and innovative in others. And, and so you always have to have that mindset of, like, who's doing great work, who's really attacking supply chain problems or other issues in a really interesting and innovative way. So it's a great cohort of like-minded organizations that have that approach to thinking big, thinking about change. And it was that, the value that we saw in that community that we were a part of that made us search for a tool that would lock it in when Yvonne said that he wanted to sell the company to do more of this charitable work. And we struggled initially to find a tool that wouldn't put the business at risk long term. And we would not do any transaction you know, to meet this need that Yvonne had to release more value unless it came along with the, the ability to durably commit Patagonia to its mission going forward. So the, the risk that a new owner or a group of owners would come in and you know, today they would be like-minded, maybe they'd sign a contract, I'm thinking of like the Ben and Jerry's exit with Unilever, um, you know, sort of like, well, that's a piece of paper and you can enforce it and you have to monitor that long-term and, and who's going to be doing that. And we were looking for a more durable, more structural solution to that issue and we found this tool of the Perpetual Purpose Trust, which serves as the, the deadbolt um, we're probably, I mean, I, when I go to the hotel, I'm like, the chain, the deadbolt, the chair behind your door, not like, this is like, and in that sense, it's, it is truly this, this, this multiple fail-safes, structural fail-safes for things to go wrong. The board, the, the management team reports day-to-day -to, -day to the board, the, and employees and other stakeholders, and has that accountability. Then they're accountable to the board of Patagonia. The board is accountable to the trust. The trust is accountable to this role that's, Natalie may talk about, but the protector or enforcer. So there's multiple levels of, of fail-safes and accountability. Nothing happens fast, and therefore nothing that risks the purpose of Patagonia can happen fast. And, and there's a lot of tension built into the system purposely. Um, so in that sense, everything we were doing was to protect everything we'd already done and committed to. And, um, and it was a tool that, you know, we'd like to share in opportunities like this of how if you're a benefit corporation or, or not or thinking about it, you might have a different tool if you need an exit to permanently protect your business durably going forward. Thanks for that, Greg. I am um, going to go to Natalie because Natalie has done so much around uh, perpetual purpose trust. And one of the things that we were talking about before getting on stage is around, and it was, you know, pointing out in the audience, like the default is around shareholder primacy, right? And really focusing on uh, control by investors. And one of the things that you all are uh, aligned around is the opportunity for a per perpetual purpose trust to actually recode sort of the expectations and create a new norm. And so I'd love for Natalie, if you can offer some historic context as well around perpetual purpose trusts, what exactly are they? <laughs> um, you know, you've worked on so many different, you know, I don't want to say transactions, but so many opportunities around this. So if you can provide some context, like where you're seeing the opportunities hit it, um, like are there, are, is that sort of like more active ground, more movement, um, and also just share some more perspectives. Um, you know, Greg was able to share about Patagonia, but if you can share about some other opportunities as well. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, so Perpetual Purpose Trust. So they came on the scene in the early 2000s. They're available in 12 states now. Trust code um, evolved, and this is a change in the uniform trust code. And basically what it is is it's a non-charitable trust that can hold an asset for an ongoing purpose. So rather than humans as beneficiaries of the asset held in the trust, so that is their private property, instead um, you have a purpose um, that is benefited from the asset held in the trust. And so in the early years, this was used for things like holding an art collection, maintaining a cemetery, things that were um, to benefit non-human beneficiaries. Um, but over time, that has evolved. In the last five years, we've seen companies using perpetual purpose trust 
to hold some part of their ownership or all of their ownership. So the company stock is actually transitioned, part or all of it, into a trust. So now your new owner is a purpose. So the great thing about that is um, we know humans uh, can be great owners. They can be great stewards of their companies, building their companies and creating culture and delivering value. And, um, but humans often need to retire. They need to exit their company. They might pass away. And so how do we perpetuate these companies that it's really beyond the founder, their purpose, if they're successful and is affecting thousands of people, thousands of lives, all the people that work in those companies, all the people that supply goods to those companies, all the people that um, are uh, consumers of their products. Um, and so we want these companies to go on and so we need structures that will perpetuate them, to Greg's point. So, you know, I want to mention perpetual purpose trusts are just one in a suite of kind of an emerging uh, conversation around shared ownership models, alternative ownership models. Um, a framework that I really like is called stewardship ownership. And um, perpetual purpose trusts meet the steward ownership criteria. There's kind of three key design principles in these structures. One is the company is self-owned. So it's not a commodity for sale. The company is self-owned by and for its purpose. That's why it exists. The company exists to create products and services that are of value to society and furthering a purpose. Um, the second feature is that the governance is held by people who are good at stewarding the company on that path to the purpose. So it's uh, held usually closely by people who have demonstrated leadership and ability at guiding the company. And then the third is that the economic rights or the, the wealth and the value that's being created in the company is reinvested back into the purpose and shared with people who are contributing value to that purpose. So investors have a role to play that they bring capital to the table that can help grow these purpose companies, um, sometimes create liquidity for a founder exit. Um, workers are delivering value by bringing their energy and cr creativity to the company every day to um, accelerate the purpose, um, potentially customers or people in the supply chain. So you can design um, one of these models to really share governance and share rewards with people who are creating the value. So I'll just give a few examples of companies that are choosing these because we're seeing a big, a big variety. Um, so some companies are more focused on, say, social justice or employee worker benefit. So a great example, a couple of examples here in California, there's an organization called California Harvesters. They are a farm labor uh, contracting company. So they have over a thousand workers. And um, that's a historically very exploitive industry where the owners, the farm labor contractors, um, really exploit the farm workers. So they started this company. They were able to bring in um, equity, private equity financing to grow the company. But the governance is held by the farm workers. And the farm workers share in the economic returns and the profit sharing of the company. So that's an example of kind of more of a social justice worker focus. Um, some companies have more of a um, kind of community benefit and staying rooted in their place focus. So um, an example of that is um, uh, Zingerman's uh, community of businesses in Ab Ann Arbor, Michigan. So. Um, they started off as a chain of delis, and they grew and grew. Now they have a bakehouse and a candy shop and a mail order cat catalog and a training program. They have over 850 uh, employees in this community of businesses. But their whole thing was staying rooted in Ann Arbor and growing a diversity of businesses that shared their values around treating employees well, creating awesome products, and contributing economic value to the community. So... They're an example of kind of a place-based purpose trust that's reinvesting back into the community and sharing with the workers. And then for some companies, it's really, you know, more of an environmental focus. So, um, you know, I worked with a company, organically grown company. Our purpose was to transform food and agriculture. So how do you do that? So our purpose is really about rewarding the farmers, the customers, the employees, and investors on balance, because we're all part of building a sustainable food food system. So um, it really depends on, on what your purpose is, how you structure, um, who gets to participate. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot of great context. And I, so 
This was not in like one of the pre-questions, so I'm ad-libbing here, I'm sorry. Um, but Natalie, you mentioned investors, and we've talked to, you know, some like mentioned shareholder primacy. So one question I have to you and Greg is actually, what are the conversations like with prospective investors and existing shareholders? Because um, when I think about, you know, at least folks I recognize in the audience, it seems like we've got a range of folks, some folks who might be looking to potentially invest into professional pur purpose trusts, might have some business owners, some entrepreneurs, folks who are working at companies that are trying to work this through. So I'm just curious in terms of the, uh, your experiences on the investment side of things. Uh, I know, Greg, obviously very different context for you, uh, but Natalie, you've seen a number of things. So could you offer some perspective or some, some context? I think your OGC experience is probably yeah. the most on point. Yeah, so um, for companies that want to structure into a perpetual purpose trust, um, certainly there are some founders who are in a position to donate their company into a trust or are part of the company into a trust. And a lot of um, owners will do seller financing into a trust. So they'll get, um, uh, you know, note issued by the company to pay for them for their stock and transfer ownership into perpetual purpose trust over time. Um, you know, most of the companies I work with, they're not in a position to just donate their company. The founders have... Which is probably likely a, a mini company. Yeah. So their they're founders, this is, that's been their sweat equity, and they invested money and time themselves to start and grow their company. So even though their company really exists for a purpose bigger than them, they need some of that value out. So um, we've... Uh, Greg wanted me to mention the organically grown uh, scenario. So... Organically grown, largest distributor of organic fruits and vegetables in the country. We were in this position where we had an employee stock ownership plan and 45 uh, founding member owners. And the company was worth a lot. And we had people knocking on our door all the time looking to buy the company, but we were interested in staying focused on our purpose, self-governed by people inside the company, and making sure that most of the money was reinvested in the company and shared with people over time. So in that scenario, we had to recapitalize the business in order to get into, into a purpose trust. So we did a combination of um, debt, um, shout out to RSF Social Finance, um, also um, Mission Driven Finance has participated in some of these deals as a debt partner. Um, so, you know, conventional loan, looking at, you know, what the company could support with its cash flows, and that provided us with the cash to be able to pay that fair value to owners as they were exiting the company and putting it, the ownership towards the purpose and perpetuity. And then um, we also were able to uh, raise money during the process. So we raised um, a preferred equity, and the way it's structured is the investment isn't predicated on selling the company to the highest bidder someday down the road. The investment is, um, the terms are that the investors uh, share in uh, the returns of the company over time through a dividend. But the way we've structured the dividend is that it's, um, they've get, got a baseline dividend, but then the upside is shared amongst different stakeholders in the company. So employees, farmers, community and customers. So that way, as the company moves towards its purpose and generates returns, all these folks are incentivized to share in the economic value that's created. So um, we had uh, a group of investors that signed up for, you know, in 18 months, we were able to raise over $12 million. So um, it can be done. You have to find, the, this isn't for everyone, like not all investors want kind of a, a dividend-based return over time. Um, but some will definitely participate in these, in these structures because they believe in kind of the impact and, and the value that the company is creating. Can I, I'll just share, um... Um, the first time I'd ever heard of an, a perpetual purpose trust was because of the OGC transaction that Natalie led um, the company through, and, um, and b mainly because I was always poking around because I knew Yvonne was going to do something like he was going to, and eventually I was going to get the call that he wanted to sell the company. And so we were always looking at, like, what is interesting and different that we might be able to use as a tool to, to deliver to him what he wanted. And there aren't many moments in my life where I feel like I've found, like, a treasure map of, um, like, something that just opened the world in terms of what was possible. But I read an article um, about the OGC transition. There's a term sheet that I think is still online that you can see. And it's just, it's brilliant. It's some of the most brilliant thinking and creative approach to financing, and it really shows 
when a business um, meets with investors who are thinking differently with stakeholders who are reaching for something different and possible and when you put profit and I think your expression is in the right relationship with all these other stakeholders and capital in the right relationship it's just incredibly exciting at some of the outcomes that you can achieve and so I think that term sheet is probably still online it's some of the most brilliant structuring and, and packaging of an opportunity that I've ever seen so it's really exciting yeah I think what's, what's really striking for me is you know as Natalie pointed out there's so much diversity in what type of purposes a company might want to uh, put in perpetuity and at the same time, the amount of creativity uh, that can be applied to making this work, it's something that both excites me <laughs> and is really interesting. And I also know it's a challenge in terms of to your point that everyone, investor, wants to get into this. But the point is, there's actually so many different opportunities to actually make this work. You know, I think oftentimes people think that this is too big of a challenge, it's too difficult, uh, but there's actually some practical resources. And to your point, I mean, there's actually online resources that one of the great things about this is that because folks in this space are so purpose-driven, there's a lot of transparency. Um, a lot of things that people have already done that they want to get out there to make it a lot easier for the next person to execute against these, uh, these things. Oh, sorry, were you gonna... I was going to say, well, I, I think it's also a little bit of a threat. I think there are a lot of investors out there who, um, who think capital is perfectly in the right relationship today of where it needs to be and, and you know, wanting it to be you know, this unity of ownership and control, and, you know, as long as the business is able to generate a return, they get unlimited future economic benefits. So I think it's just, um, you know, there's a, what generates more profit purpose or just focusing on near-term shareholder value. I think it's just a really interesting inflection point in the market right now. And since we're talking about structures right now, I talked about OGC structure, but we were also talking uh, in, earlier, another creative structure for capital participation is Yes, you get, you know, the revenue or the profits first until you get to a certain cap, and then your shares are redeemed. So that way you're rewarded for the, the early risk and investment that you took, but at some point the company can redeem it and be owned by and for its purpose moving forward. Thank you for that. Um, I want to go back to Sarah, because you, are, you, you started us off with such great context. Um, and from the perspective of B-Lab, because there's so much that... Um, quite frankly, a lot of uh, adjacent movements um, companies are relying upon for, from B-Lab. So you touched on this a little bit ago when you opened up your remarks, but can you share a bit about how B-Lab has been thinking about incorporating, you know, within your metrics, things like perpetual purpose trust? Sure. <clears throat> um, so as I mentioned, the, the standards, which is um, really the core of, of who B-Lab is, um, it is what the certification is then um, generated from. We are working um, on those right now. Um, to this point around transparency, we have a series of public consultation periods. So I would encourage folks to go to our website, um, bcorporation.net, to take a look. You can see kind of where those are. We're very open about it. And then you can also see the upcoming dates for these um, public consultation periods. A lot of active members of the B Corp community have a lot, of, a lot to say on that. But um, welcome folks to, to go there. Um, I think, as I mentioned, part of this evolution is taking a look at, um, it is really rooted in impact. So we are not, I don't think any of us are on this stage because we are or doing this work because it just feels really nice and you can, you know, look yourself in the mirror at night, although that helps. But uh, this is very much rooted in impact. So how do we at B-Lab, through our certification, through our evolving standards, how do we incentivize more impact, both through that certification, the more rigorous standards that absolutely do incorporate more rigor around um, shareholder, uh, uh, stakeholder uh, governance rather than shareholder primacy, among other things that I mentioned. Um, and we also are very much looking at then how do we actually, you know, Greg, you were mentioning the, the um, value that Patagonia has seen in the community. There's a lot of potential there as well. As I mentioned, there's 8,000 B Corps that represents 700,000 workers. I don't know how much money, I probably should know, but it represents a lot. It's a good, it's good sample size, we've got proof of concept, and we've got a lot of um, interest there. What more can we do as, as a movement? And one of the questions is, what are the other alternative forms um, of, of corporate ownership and governance that could work? Because not every company should become a B Corp, not every company can move to a perpetual purpose trust, 
we're offering to, you know, looks at, at what this could look like. Um, from my perspective, me personally, and I would say B-Lab as well, again, it's about impact. And it's not just measuring the impact, but understanding how do you continue to improve upon that impact. Measure, manage, improve. And so thank you, Greg, for pointing out the B-Impact assessment. That's this online tool. Um, we've had, I think, over a quarter million um, users of that tool. Most of them are not B Corps, right? But many of them do use that tool to, to Greg's point, check where they're at, and then hopefully raise their hand and come and work with us or others to identify how can they improve in, in those areas. Um, so I don't know if that totally got to your question, but I think it's kind of um, an important point just to remind us all we're here, I think, around impact. And these are two tools by which we, we are believers in, in um, that, that they can continue to drive more impact. And one of the things I, I think that is important, this kind of like public consultation process that B-Lab is going through is that it actually engenders the, the sort of values around um, centering other perspectives and voices. Um, because as many of us, you know, working in this, well, in this space and other areas, um, what types of metrics, what types of uh, things are measured for performance, that's oftentimes has no consideration for a variety of stakeholders. <laughs> and so that's a big component to this, obviously. So just want to uplift that piece. Um, Sarah, you also, um, I, you know, there's such a wide breadth of companies in, um, in the B-Live community. You know, obviously Patagonia, large company that everyone knows about. Um, as you said, there are other considerations that business owners are considering. They might not do uh, uh, a trust. They might opt for something different. And I'm just, if you could share a bit of what you're seeing in the B-Lab community of some other alternatives. Um, and, and actually, are there, are there particular pain points that you see that have, that have sort of prevented folks from moving forward with something like a perpetual purpose trust? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, well, so the B Corp community itself is is quite a mix. Yes, we have the Patagonias, um, the Warby Parkers, Allbirds, number of companies have, who have gone public and have done so successfully. And we have um, a number, uh, just a, the majority of the movement has started with um, SMEs. And so it's quite a mix of, you know, size, revenue, every sort of um, diversity measure one might look at. And so because of that, I think it, it you know, does vary. Um, to be honest, I think that most of the company, most of the B Corps are, um, have, have sort of made their choice for right, for right now that, that B Corp certification is um, the right community for them. And hopefully we're working on this, but are, and are also understanding that that's not the end of the story. That means that, great, you've gone through, you've proven that you are worthy of this certification and there can be sort of revenue implications for that and the ways that companies take advantage of that. But that's not enough. That's why we have this B Impact Assessment. We're working on additional tools as we um, roll out the new standards as well. So that's an ongoing um, body of work as well over the next couple of years. But additional tools to really look at what are the other ways that we improve performance. So I'm not sure that I am I, unfortunately, I don't feel that I can really speak to perhaps um, if there's sort of an agitation or interest in different sort of models beyond B Corps. Certainly, there's been a ton of interest in this perpetual purpose trust, probably in large part because of Patagonia, like that was such an obvious high profile example. So there are questions and, and interest in that area. Um, for me, what we see in the B Corp community is again, it's about the impact. and so they have decided that the B Corp certification and working with us with other tools is the right way to, to do that for them. That makes sense. I, I am um, I'm thinking about um, this idea around aligning all the stakeholders. And I'm sure that's probably some of the messiest components, <laughs> um, or maybe not. Um, and so I, if, 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 if you could share a little bit, maybe I'll just go down the line, Natalie, you start off in terms of you know, what have been some, some things that stand out to you? Because one, you've got, you know, you're aligning things around employees, your own, you know, um, existing ownership, <laughs> um, 
and also thinking about future stakeholders as well and keeping that in mind. Um, so I'm just curious if you could just share a little bit about some of those, you know, the, the, the little bit of the messiness that is involved in this process too. Hi. Um, well, so that's actually one of the reasons why people are choosing this model. So um, Greg was talking about kind of who's at the center of the universe in your business. And ownership has a lot to do with that, right? So in traditional business models, those who invest are the shareholders. And that entitles them to both control of the company and governance rights, as well as economic rights in the company. And so, so what's the alternative? So, you know, some companies have thought about, well, who do we have at the center if it's not shareholders? So there's other forms of ownership like cooperative ownership. So you might have a single stakeholder group now at the center of the universe. So let's say a worker cooperative. The workers are at the center of the universe. They now hold the governance rights. This, they elect the board, they serve in a governance role, they decide what direction the company's headed over time, and they also reap the economic rewards. Um, or you have a producer cooperative. It's the farmers at the center of the universe, and they're the ones who control the board and, and share the economic benefits. But I think what's going on here is people are starting to recognize that in order to build a great company, you can't just have one stakeholder group at the center of the universe because you will get out of balance in your performance. So I think there's a real case to be made from a business value proposition that we have to put none of those stakeholders at the center of the universe. We've got to put the purpose of why the business exists and who it exists to serve and what it's trying to do in the world through its products and services and the impact it's trying to create at the center. And then we put the other stakeholders um, in alignment around that purpose through shared governance and shared returns. Now, that doesn't mean that it's democracy all the time in these structures. So, you know, we're still in these structures looking at a stewardship group that is um, elected and nominated because they've demonstrated the best capacity in ensuring that the business vehicle stays financially healthy because without the financial health, there's no purpose, that the strategic plans are good, that the operating plans are good, that the business doesn't overcapitalize itself and isn't able to pay back folks and needs to sell itself to somebody else. I mean, these are, you need good leadership. And, um, but you have leadership at the center that's focused on answering to the purpose and stakeholders can you know, participate in giving feedback to that leadership, potentially electing that leadership or ser serving in those leadership roles. But again, it's still gotta be merit-based that you've demonstrated good stewardship to the purpose. Um, so yeah, I mean, multi-stakeholder is messy, but it doesn't have to be if you put the right structure in place. And also multi-stakeholder can create, I think, better business performance because you recognize that you need to, whoever's in leadership needs to balance. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give the example of when I was working at Organically Grown. Well, if the farmers were at the center of the universe, we'd think about just paying the farmers as much as we could at the expense of, and we might start to lose customers because our prices are too high. Or if the workers were at the center of the universe, we'd dedicate everything towards, you know, worker income and maybe not pay the farmers as well and not have the prices as good for the customers. The investors are at the center, we think about rewarding them. So it's that, I actually think that multi-stakeholder can create better governance towards a more holistically performing business. I like, I love that. I think we think about it in terms of um, engineered tensions within the business. When we um, went through the ownership change, there's a lot of confusion from the business where everyone thought we were, now we were just a nonprofit company, which was, wasn't true. We were. Patagonia continued to be a for-profit company. Um, we had to make a profit. Um, we had just messed with what is that right relationship for us. The Purpose Trust was the mechanism to lock in, you know, we're in business to save our home planet for good. That's not going to change. Um, it didn't need financial resources to really enforce that mission, um, so it didn't need 100% ownership. Um, what was important to our stakeholders was that we were doing more to release value from the business in an efficient way. 
which is why we came up with the Holdfast Collective, which is receiving dividends tax-free from the business. And so we were really able to amplify um, for that constituency, for that stakeholder that was important to us, um, resources to go out and achieve that mission. But there's been, over this last year, a lot of conversations around, because you know, there's always things that you can do better. Um, and I think you know, the example where people thought we were not, they just didn't, we didn't do a good job of actually communicating what was really happening day in and day out. And the reality was nothing was changing for the business. What we were doing the day before the ownership change is exactly the same as we were doing the day after the ownership change, exactly the same, hopefully in 100 years as we would be doing it sort of with the philosophy in mind for future decision makers of what would Yvonne do in these situations. And, um, and so, so that was, that was, and to achieve and to get more visibility and literacy in terms of what we were doing, we just weren't doing a good job of communicating with employees like, well, this is what we're doing from a compensation perspective. This is what we're doing from a leadership and development perspective. This is what we're doing in our supply chain and the investments that we're making. This is what we're reinvesting in our systems to put you in a better position to be able to execute more effectively. And so just better internal communication about how before we even issue dividends, how we are allocating the value that business creates among all these different segments. And so I think it's actually been a really great learning process for us because there's a lot of hard work that everyone in the business is doing to make all of this happen, and now we just have better transparency, internal transparency, in terms of how we're making it day to day. Thanks for that, Greg. So I'm gonna actually um, take some moderator privileges here because there's been, I've been receiving these questions from the audience, and uh, we're supposed to start those a little bit later, but there's a number of them that are actually, I mean, they're, they're good questions, so I wanna just have enough opportunity to kind of address them, right? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, great. See, I asked for, I asked for permission, got, uh, the panelist said it's okay. Um, so, I'm gonna start, and I'm just gonna do these in the order that I received them. Um, it's actually a question that's really uh, dear to me. So, how have you seen companies build in racial equity, gender equity, and other types of equity into ownership and governance models? What worked, what didn't? Um, I would assume that this is, this is broader than um, perpetual purpose trust as well. Um, so, so if you can lean into to, to sort of the broadness based on like the question itself. Okay, I'll go. Um, so rethinking ownership, ownership has not historically been available to everyone. There have been communities that have been systematically shut out of ownership and opportunities for ownership. So to me, this really gets at the heart of I think somebody commented earlier, if we want to get towards equity, we need to think about how we actually share governance and returns with people who have been systematically left out of those opportunities. And so, um, you know, uh, examples of this um, are in the perpetual purpose trust movement are plenty. I'd say the main vehicle is um, sharing governance, so through board seats and stakeholders participating on board seats, um, as well as uh, shared return, so where the profits are directly contributed, like a chunk of the company profits are directly contributed to the people who are creating the value. So I'll give a, a, uh, an example, another example of a purpose trust-owned company. So there's a company called Optimax, which is a manufacturer of optical lenses. And um, they manufacture, design, so they've got a bunch of technical designers as well as blue collar folks working at Optimax Max Manufacturing. And they're based in Rochester, New York. And they decided to do a purpose trust because the founder comes from a background that is based in Rochester, blue collar background, and he wants to make sure that over time the value that they're creating, they make lenses for like the Mars rovers and NASA, is actually going back to the community in which it operates. So that's an example of how they have embedded within a structure um, wealth and shared returns um, going back to the communities that are creating value that have often been shut out of ownership. What came to mind for me is um, 
And this is candidly something that Patagonia has done a lot of, has had to do a lot of work on. I mean, historically, we were hiring out of a, a pretty local population in Southern California, which kind of came along with some certain disparities in, in composition for employees. Um, we have had to do a lot of work around evaluating our hiring practices and making sure that, you know, the kind of talent that we're looking at is inclusive and in looking in different places. Um, and that's, it's been really exciting actually to see the results of that. A lot of new ideas, better ideas than ever, a lot of highly motivated individuals. Um, the work from home hybrid environment has made it a little challenging, but it's great to see everyone getting on campus again. Um, and now those types of hiring practice that we have ultimately will lead over time into leadership roles for those individuals and, you know, potentially board seats. And so that's an exciting change to see happen. I haven't seen like a purpose trust like principle, our purpose press principles can change over time, so that may end up being something that's more or less memorialized in the purpose trust. But as of right now, it's it's part of our benefit corporation sort of evaluative criteria, and so from that, and in the sense that our trust locks in those criteria, that change is here to stay. Um, thanks. I, a couple things that just came to mind um, from the B Lab perspective. So one, as I mentioned, eight thousand community strong. There are a lot of learnings um, that this is a really innovative community. So there are a lot of learnings, there's a lot of testing, trying, failing, that we are um, working to both capture and then also um, share out to, um, to further, to, to speed up the efficiency with which other companies might try things. Um, the second, I mentioned our evolving standards. We, one of our standards, one pillar, is around what we call JEDI, which is Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. So there will be um, very clear measures um, in there. If you want to become a B Corp, recertify as a B Corp, you need to meet those standards, and more is available on our website. The third I wanted to mention is that um, we took a decision from the beginning that the B Corp community needed to be accessible, and that means a lot of different things, including reducing financial barriers. You have to pay money. If you want to certify, you pay money. We're underpriced, um, in my opinion, but. Um, what that has meant is that we have, um, we at BLAB have subsidized that cost so that in particular in emerging markets around the world, that that cost to certify, to just go through the cert certification um, to see if you're eligible to become a B Corp, um, we've been subsidizing that. So the community is much more diverse than it might have been otherwise. The fourth piece and last piece I will say that came to mind is that um, we have also really worked to center JEDI, 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 Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, in everything that we do, including programs that we're developing. So these are all philanthropically supported, which is why we, we hope to build on these. But we have um, a program now, I think we're in the third iteration of it, called Level. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, this is focused on BIPOC owners, specifically, um, where we bring together cohorts of BIPOC owners for learnings, but also to put them in front of access to capital. Um, so helping to ensure that these um, opportunities that might not otherwise be available to, to Natalie's point are um, not only available, but we're actually prioritizing those folks. Um, so those are less on the sort of governance side and more on the sort of programmatic, but wanted to share those pieces. Thanks for that. And this, this question's um, uh, not connected to the, most, the, the last one, but I think it's something that we actually briefly touched on before the panel. Um, so I'm going to sort of condense this uh, question. But the question is really looking at the, the su support functions that actually help to activate these alternative ownership and governance models, and specifically the role of lawyers, accountants, tax advisors, wealth advisors, et cetera. Natalie, I see you uh, uh, smirking over there. Um, so, so if you could just offer some perspective there, because I will, I will say that before we had this panel, you know, that is always, you know, we had a brief conversation in my experience, how do you make sure that you can bring to bear the most creativity from those, <laughs> from those functions? Um, and it can be a hurdle. I mean, I've certainly experienced that directly. So any, any thoughts that you might have to share? Yeah. Um, well, I think we need networks of lawyers, CPAs, and others who are interested in these models. Um, and we're starting to grow that. So I've actually been working with some academics um, to map the landscape of service providers that are working on these stewardship ownership models. Um, so that can be available to entrepreneurs and investors who are interested in doing this. 
We need more open source materials. So Greg said he saw our term sheet online. You know, to what extent can we share how um, companies are structuring um, uh, equity and debt in these deals? Um, and so open source materials, connecting people with um, the advisors, and certainly this needs to be taught, you know, in law school and business school as one of the options. I think it's more common that we think that um, you know, we design ownership so that ownership always has economic rights and governance rights, but really starting to work with folks who can innovatively pick apart, okay, what are you trying to achieve and how do we structure the right people at the table in right relationship with the right um, rights to either value creation or governance in this thing. And um, I think it's coming, but I think it's early days. Like, I think that this is basically kind of the bleeding edge of the socially responsible company ESG movement. You know, first people thought, well, how do we support more products and services that are better for people and the planet? And then it was, well, how do we make sure that those values carry into the entire operation of how the company is run? Like, how are the workers treated who make those products? And what kind of energy does the facility run on? And all of that. And I think the next thing is, okay, so who's in the boardroom and who's getting the value that's created from this company? And so to me, this is the logical next step for this movement um, is to really start to unpack ownership and ownership design and to reconfigure it in ways that um, center purpose. So um, it's coming. Uh, I'm writing a book on this topic of purpose, trust, ownership, and we're um, going to be creating kind of a trade association for people who are doing work in this field to be able to network and share best practices and open source materials. I'll just add to all of that, and I'm excited and looking forward to the book. Um, a lot of this is some simple stuff, like if you're out there um, and you're interested in this and you're talking to your startup lawyer that helped you build your business, they are, they're a corporate lawyer. They don't do, if, when you get into trust world, it's, it's personal, estate tax, um, family planning, totally different if your law firm even has that department. A lot of them have broken apart from these big law firms, so it's, if you want to talk about purpose trust, ask them very directly, you know, do you have a trust in a state's lawyer? Because that's the kind of expertise they need. And for a lot of this work, you get into tax exempt areas too, which they may not have. And so a lot of times, you know, they might, and it's appropriate to, to go to that sort of startup lawyer, but you might just need to get expertise from other firms to connect the dots. Same thing for accounting, because there's sort of groups that just practice in charitable versus for... So you kind of have to, unfortunately, right now where we are, because this is so interdisciplinary, I experienced this completely. We had to kind of sit between a lot of functional areas to make this work, because they don't, norm they don't think and connect these dots, because they never had to before. Um, so just reach out and just ask those kind of direct questions so you save yourself some time and headache. I'm going to add one thing. Don't take no for an answer. I was in the boardroom at Organically Grown and we were talking about structures and I was saying our structure is problematic. It could lead to an eventual sale of the business someday and then all this that we're building will be in trouble. And so I literally had people go, there's no other solution. We've already been a nonprofit and decided to be a for-profit. Then we were a cooperative, but we decided that it wasn't just about the farmer. So then we added on an employee stock ownership plan. Like we've been through every structure, there's nothing else. And I just kept pushing and talking to folks and talking to folks. And I, so don't take no for an answer. You can build this structure that will support your purpose. You just have to get creative and keep, keep talking to folks. And I do want to point out that Greg is the only attorney on this panel. Uh, they do exist with this type of creativity. But one thing I want to double down um, in terms of what uh, Natalie pointed out, because there's analogous sort of thing on this one, the on the sort of like impact investor type side where, you know, I've, I've seen where consultants and advisors begin to wield more power than the actual client. And so you say, hey, we want to be able to invest directly into racial justice. And then, you know, your consultant says, we can't do that. We can't figure that out. Well, you're actually the person that has the power in an equation. It, you know, we, we talked a little bit about power earlier, but there's sort of like this, this more specific relationship. Oftentimes think about this from the fact that somehow FTX was able to find accountants and attorneys to make that work. Um, but when it comes not to things... Not purpose-owned. It was that? Not purpose-owned. Exactly, not, not purpose-owned. Um, 
But when, it become, when, it, when you get to a place where you're trying to actually figure out ways that you can create economic rights, power for regular folks and purpose, uh, it gets a little dicier. So, I did, so just to double down on what Natalie pointed out, it's not you know, accepting the no, but also pushing to say, hey, you know, we can find another attorney. We can find another accountant if you can't figure this out. Uh, because you're seeing some of that, again, on an analogous side, you're seeing more some growth in some other investment type vehicles, specifically because you know, investors say, we want this, right? And so I just wanted to like, double down on that. It, totally. I mean, there's a lot of, when you talk to even found, like there's a lot of unarticulated expectations and, and they won't even go to certain places because they just assume that you want a liquidity event. So it's just, you kind of need to be, really direct and really over communicate in terms of what you're trying to achieve and what you're willing to walk away from or what value you're, I wouldn't say you're walking away from the value, you're reallocating the value among other stakeholders. And so when people start to, because they, were, they didn't go to law school, they don't teach us in business school. So this is like, this is really early. Um, so we only have, so what we're going to do, we have five more minutes and when I ask this one question and we'll close out. But having said that, we're going to have 15 minutes of time, right, uh, Michelle, to, for folks to be able to interface with the, the panel more casually. Um, this is a very uh, specific and, and uh, question because I think, Natalie, you had pointed this out. Um, there, there are only a few states that already have perpetual purpose trust written in. Um, and so what are equivalent, so the question is, what are equivalent options, what equivalent options are available elsewhere and so that's especially outside of the U.S. So if you can actually kind of U.S. and uh, outside of U.S. context. So in the U.S., there's there's 12 states. Um, we actually just passed legislation in Oregon a couple of years ago to allow these types of trusts. So I would encourage folks who might be academics, legal scholars, that there's a business opportunity here. Like that's how we brought it to our legislature was we will help more companies stay independent and contributing in our state if we have passed this legislation that allows companies to be owned by an Oregon Stewardship Trust is the way we um, pitched it. Um, but companies can use other states to house their trusts even if they are not domiciled in those states. Again, I'm not a lawyer, but he is. Um, that, but like we've, so we've worked with California companies that are owned by a Delaware Purpose Trust, for example. Um, Internationally, I'd say, you know, the trust code is different per country. So I actually live in Canada, and that's kind of linked. Uh, I, and I've had a fellowship in New Zealand, um, and there's kind of a, a set of trust code that the crown countries share, for example. So you kind of are looking at what are the, the common uh, trust codes and available structures uh, per country. I know Germany is actually just passing... Um, a new legal form for a self-owned company, which will match this criteria. So that's why I like to go back to the design principles. Like, there's different vehicles in different countries, but I think these the, de the design principles of what, what I call stewardship ownership, which is really looking at how can a company stay um, independent um, at, for the long term, um, share the governance with the people who are the best stewards of its enduring purpose, and then uh, share the economic rewards with those who are creating the value and reinvest, and, and give yourself enough to reinvest in the company too, not just pull it all out of the company. And so what are the structures that allow you to do that? So, um, you know, and another thing is like for, for other countries, um, for example, as part of my fellowship in New Zealand, there were awesome lawyers in the States who were willing to donate their time to meet with lawyers in New Zealand. I like facilitated a Zoom call and we said, okay, explain what we're doing here. And then the lawyers in the New Zealand legal context will discuss how it might happen there. So you don't have to be an expert in like every country's law, but you could ask somebody who's doing these structures elsewhere to kind of educate your advisors. And then your advisor could say, wait a second, this is how we could do that same thing here, but using our legal code. I, I would add, if you're like, if your business is in Florida, you don't have to wait until Florida passes a purpose trust statute. They probably never will um, with the current leadership. Um, you never know. And, but you can throw in a grappling hook to someplace like 
Delaware, or you can use a corporate trustee. It adds a little bit of a layer of complexity, but it's totally doable. And um, I mean, they, they do services all the time in different contexts, so it's, it's useful. And, or you can go to some other state, um, South Dakota and Wyoming come to mind, where you can create your own private family trust company and you can find a partner to set that up for you. They do that in a lot of other contexts too. So you don't have to wait until your, your home jurisdiction figures this out.